Hey everyone, it's Caroline Modoresi Tirani. I'm here with the fantastic actor Michael Emerson, who of course stars in the CBS series Person of Interest, now in its final season. Michael, how are you? Fifth and final season. Yes, I'm, I'm good, thanks, because I'm getting a chance to rest a little bit. <laughs> we're, we're all done. Well, I mean, you've been on the go, haven't you, for quite some time now? Yeah, I, I've done two big network series in a row, so I'm, I'm a little worn out. I'm, I'm taking a little time off now, you know, to recharge the battery and uh, try to think if there isn't some easier way to make a living. Right. <laughs> I'm not as fun, though. It might be easier, but not as fun, I would imagine. It's been great fun. There, there, well, it's, it's been a lot of everything, a, a, a lot of magic landscapes and late nights and bizarre interactions with local people and uh, everything you can want, and, and great scene work and great writing. Well, I'm going to say, because I mean, the executive producers, uh, Jonathan Nolan's one of them, uh, and in terms of the, the sort of basic premise of the show and this notion of where humans and, and AI sort of interact and the blurring of those boundaries, was that something before you started the show that was of interest to you at all? Were you sort of into that kind of realm? I'm not a big science fiction reader, but I was interested in that idea or that problem of an artificial superintelligence. That's that's a genie once released that is hard to get back into the bottle, and I'm not sure we are as advanced ethically as we are technologically. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a problem that was on my mind, and now I'm very keenly aware of it, having worked on this show for five years and, and seen all the various imagined dilemmas that can come from it. Yeah, well, I mean, Elon Musk is an example, you know, everyone knows him as somebody who's very big in that space, and he has said, hasn't he, that he's very concerned about artificial intelligence, he thinks that it'll finish us off, basically. And if he says that, we should listen to him, and he, he's not the only one, there are, there are a lot of advanced thinkers in, in the realm of cybernetics and artificial intelligence who say it's coming, it's coming fast, and better start thinking about it. Yeah, well, lots of people are fascinated by the show. Uh, Ira Revels, who's watching, hey, Ira, says, cool show. Sonia Ives says, I'll miss the show. It's a great TV show. Jen Beniston says, sad to see it end. Uh, and Michelle Mayen says, love personal interest. We'll miss it. Um, it really has captured the, uh, I guess, the imaginations, if not hearts, of, of people who are watching. Um, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that, obviously, it could, it could have been something that's very cold and, and, and not sort of captive in that way that it seems to be? I think it works on a lot of levels. I think it's good writing to begin with, and there's good actor chemistry on the show, and that's a thing that you can't plan for. That either happens or it doesn't. I, I think the themes of the show are of interest. I think uh, people like uh, people like the genre shows, you know, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Ours felt a little bit like a science fiction show when it started out, and then we discovered that real life events took over, and we became much more a science fact show and in, instead of being out in front in, in technological thinking we were playing catch up to real world events. And were is there any of those, you know, when you see the scripts, when the scripts come in, were there any ones that you were either extremely excited about or that, that were sort of piqued your curiosity? Well, often the scripts would contain technical material that was startling. I would say we can't do that yet, can we? Oh yes, oh yes, that, that machinery is in place. Those techniques and programs already exist. We're not, we're not making something up here. This is just real stuff. So we're, we're thinking, well, what would happen if that was used in a certain way or by the wrong people? So did you ever go home and just have absolute nightmares? Then? <laughs> you see all this material you, you weren't necessarily aware of beforehand. I can imagine it could be a little bit scary at times. It, it could be worrisome. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm a little more hyper aware of where my phone is now and how I can be overheard or tracked and all of that. But what's to be done about that? You can lay awake at night, but we're not going to put these machines down. So we have to, I guess it's, it's something we have to find an acceptance. Well, for. you mentioned the uh, chemistry between the, uh, the actors. Michael Costa, who's watching, says Jim Caviezel and Michael Emerson make this show great. Uh, how would you categorize your relationship with Jim? I think it, it works because it shouldn't work. I, I think we're a kind of tonal odd couple, completely different styles of acting, completely different styles of persons, but that whatever that collision of energies is, is true to the collision of energies between the two characters. So 
it's, it just has worked. And, and I, I couldn't tell you why, other than that he and I get along r really well and we have, a, a, we, we have great fun and a collegial working relationship. But I, I couldn't have said, well, oh yeah, this is gonna, this is really gonna go. Also, I mean, I think that this is one of the things that, you know, studios, they, uh, networks, they bet on a show and, and then all of a sudden they just watch and see if it flies. Yeah, I, I think so. We all sit back and, you, you know, you do a pilot and you think, oh God, is there a chance that that would ever get picked up, that that would ever find an audience? And mm -hmm. then when it does, you're kind of startled, but suddenly you're too busy to think about it anymore. Right. Well, that's true as well. Uh, uh, this is probably a question for a lot of fans. Tim Wademan says, why is the show ending? I think there are a, a lot of business reasons for that. Certainly uh, not for lack of fan interest or for viewership because the numbers have always been high. I, I think it's a it's a really expensive and hard show to shoot and I think uh, the, the producers of the show were a, a, a little bit worn out and a little bit not knowing how to go further without either making it smaller or larger mm -hmm. and not knowing what that would look like or sound like. So I, I think they just, they reached a point where all parties said let's, maybe there's, maybe we're in a place now where we could make a, a grand ending for it. Did it have anything to do with this change of days? Because I know that it's, it's sort of changed from, uh, you know, a particular day in the week to another day that's yeah. sort of heavily <coughs> populated by Shonda Rhimes uh, and TGI. Yeah. Well, it is, it is tricky, I think, when, uh, particularly when you win your original audience at, at a certain hour on a certain night. If, if you get moved to another night, you, you can publicize it to death, but it, you still not, they just might, you know, if, particularly if it's later in the evening, people may think, God, I've just got to go to bed. And so you, you hope that they will uh, stay up a little, DVR it or, or whatever. And, well, and, and I think they have in numbers, but th those numbers are a little hard to account for mm. now. So it, the, the TV landscape, I think in general, is fragmenting a lot now, and those old you know, legacy network philosophies and scheduling principles aren't as strong as they once were. And I think everybody's scrambling. Trying to yeah. basically catch up to yeah. the, te the technology in an ironic kind of way. Yes. That's sort of the premise of your show, really. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, an, I mean, you know, as an actor, somebody who's invested in the show, I mean, is that frustrating for you, the, the, the way that the sort of landscape may necessitate these kind of other conversations or a show like this to end? I think it's a good it's a good conversation to have because I, I think the old the old network formula of shooting so many episodes every year it's 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 quite a grind mm. and I think it's taxing for all concerned hard, hard for the writers to produce that much good material hard for the actors to live up to the schedule and the working conditions all, all of that and 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 lots of money so I, it would be all right with me if everything on television was a little bit shorter and a, a little more artistically compressed. Mm. Is that something you would do next then? I mean, you know, you said you're going to have a bit of a break. Um, do you have any ideas of the sort of things you would want to do after this show has wrapped? Probably. It, it would be nice to go on the stage again because that, that's what I always did. Well, it's your roots, isn't it, really? Yes, it is. You know, you began on the stage. And I, I don't know how I wandered into the dark forest of television for <laughs> as, as long as I have done, but it's been 10 years, so it would be nice to get back on the stage somewhere, somehow. And But also to do, I, I, would, I would like now to do little bits and pieces of work that is outside the sort of character thing that I've been doing. It would be nice to do work that was a little less sinister, a little less desperate, maybe something sillier or funny. So people see a different Excellent. side of you, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that would be all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, of course, I mean, we mentioned uh, we, uh, we were mentioned sort of you know fantastic pilots. You were in another huge show, Lost, of course. Uh, and I've got a comment from Santush who says, "Would you ever be open to a Lost reboot with you reprising your role as Ben?" Oh, that that might be interesting. I think it highly unlikely, just because the, that entire creative team has moved on. But mm -hmm. never say never, I suppose. And and e even even if I personally felt in this moment that I I couldn't envision going back into the jungle and r running around at night like I used to, and being so mean and all, it still if the script was right, if it was the right, if it had the right pedigree, the right people were on board, it it might be a kick, and it, it would, you know it would be fun to 
go relive that if that's possible. Uh, do you ever speak to any of the other cast members? I mean, is this there anything that you do you reminisce about this with the the other lost? Cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, you, you, every show you do, you, you make some friends that are closer and more longer lasting than others. But sure. I'm in touch with Terry O'Quinn all the time. And, and I know <coughs> my friend Jorge is in town now in, in New York seeing shows and stuff. I need to get together with him. Let's, let's make a date. Jorge. <laughs> and I'm sure he's watching. Uh, <laughs> uh, true. But so, I mean, I think it is it's interesting. Carlton Cuse, I know he gave an interview to Digital Spy, and, and again, sort of getting back to the business side of things, he was saying, well, Disney owns the franchise of Lost. Uh, and he said he couldn't imagine that they would just sort of sit on the franchise for for that long without wanting to uh. do something with it. Oh, he said that? Apparently, according to Digital Spy, yeah, he gave an interview to them. Wow. All right. That, that makes it a little more of. Uh, of a thing that's a possibility then, I suppose. You, you're right, it's a property. It's a, it's a piece of intellectual property, fairly rich and you know, with perhaps unexplored possibilities. Well, I mean, what do you think it would have to do? I mean, if it were to come back in some guise, would there be sort of a dream scenario you could imagine yourself reprising the role of Ben? Well, I, I think there would have to be a smart reboot, a change of scene, a change of, it would have to be lost seen through another prism or maybe mm -hmm. in a different location. Maybe there's a way that it could be urban and still have the feeling of isolation or alienation with the island. Or, or, or maybe it's some other kind of island or some other place on the planet. I don't know, I don't know what it would be. The ending of the show uh, certainly had, I mean, caused a lot of consternation amongst fans. Yes. Was that something that you anticipated before the, the final sh sort of episode aired? I'm sure the creative team anticipated that there would be discussion uh, no matter how they wrapped it up. Mm. I, I didn't worry about it too much. I was surprised and pleased when I read the final script and when I saw it put together and finally broadcast I thought oh that's a fine fine end. I'm, I'm, I'm a defender of the finale of Lost and I, people stop me on the street and if if they have enough time, I'll tell them why it's such a good ending. Why do you think it's such a good ending then? What I think it about for you? I, I think every program has a kind of a narrative footprint. It may be kind of a straight line or a zigzaggy line. I think Lost narrative footprint was lines exploding in all directions. How do you how do you lasso them all? How do you bring it all to a conclusion? And I thought the smart thing they did was to bring it all back to the middle, to the place it was exploding from to end on the same image almost as it as the show began and and to go back to the center and have it be not a gimmick or some narrative trick or to to go back in a to a like a spiritual place of the hereafter of lives not having been lived in vain or the adventures of the show having added up to something meaningful and to wrap it up in the, in a way Shakespeare would have been pleased with and which he does in his comedies which is for all the everyone to go in to the future or the hereafter in pairs mm. you know happy marriages and that's sort of what was going on at, at the end there I think a, a, every character was charged with finding a mirror redeemer mm. in in their life and those that were lucky enough to do so then got to go to Paris. I mean, it's curious you mentioned the Shakespearean reference. I mean, would you categorize it as a problem play? <laughs> lost, uh, lost? If you were going to have to. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any big old <laughs> rangy show like that that went, you know, went, went all over the map, sure, it's a, it's a problem. It's a huge problem to wrap it up. Uh, well, in, in the same way for person of interest then, I mean, are you... Is that nerve-wracking thing as an actor? Obviously, you know the show is going to be coming to a conclusion and this is the final series. Was there any reticence on your part about how they were going to wrap up the show? I, I do not concern myself much with what, what the writers are doing. I, I think it's good to have, I, I have a little mental firewall between me and, and the scripts that come in. I just wait for them to come and then my, my job is to react to them as best I can or solve problems, help everyone to solve problems of how to make this cool or good or smart. Every once in a while I'll have a little chat about what a line means or what the possibilities of a scene might be. But generally I was, I was happy, expected. 
I, I'll tell you, the, I did not see the end coming until very near the end. I kept thinking, we have 13 episodes. Mm. Sh surely, I, you know, we're going to be, begin to construct the ending halfway through there. But I didn't, I didn't even get a sense of what it was going to be until maybe the last three. Is that so difficult as an actor? You know, if, if, because, you know, this is, you know, fifth season, you've obviously been married to this program, uh, you know, this experience for a number of years now. So to sort of have it almost finish off so quickly, you know, is that a little jarring for you? Yeah, well, it, w it was a little bit. It was a bit sudden or, or soon, but it, it was to be embraced, I think, partly because those last 13 were the was the hardest shooting we ever did. Mm -hmm. It was the longest, latest, worst weather, you, you, you name it. it. It was tough. So we were on our hands and knees coming in to the ending. And so I, I think we just, we, we, had, we had left it on the set. We, we had nothing left to give. And so it, it was easy to walk away from it. Was it quite an emotional rap party? I should imagine. Well, no, we, we had a kind of a rap party. But when you have the rap party before you're actually wrapped, then, I mean, you, you sort of say goodbye to people that you're then going to work with on Monday, right, Monday right. morning. And when we actually got to the end, of course, it was typically a much longer and more grueling day than anyone could have predicted. It was four in the morning, freezing cold. Everyone was just a wreck. So everyone kind of feebly waved farewell <laughs> to one another. And, Went Got into home, cars and went home and became unconscious. <laughs> For several hours, I don't know if you'd imagine. <laughs> uh, I, I've got uh, another couple of comments here uh, about Lost. Uh, so Dave McLaughlin says, "Love him. Binge watch the entire Lost series two summers ago with my sons. He's one of their favorite actors now. Bravo to all of his good work." Uh, and Bill Richardson says, "What was the fog in Lost? It never said. What did the fog mean?" He must mean the smoke monster. The this. Smoke monster was an electromagnetic projection of the ruling power of the island. It was, in effect, the henchman. There you go, Bill. If you didn't know, now you know. Michael just told you. Uh, I mean, it is, it is curious that you, you know you were saying that you'd like to try something a little bit different. Um, people have associated you, I suppose, for quite some time as this sort of like slightly odd. Sometimes slightly sinister. Um, That's probably fair. Character, and so you know, getting back to the stage is you. Know, if you don't mention Shakespeare, is sort of a Shakespearean comedy something you'd want to do? Would you want to do something totally on the other end of the spectrum and do something more modern? And you know, it's a, a dream kind of play you'd love to sort of start. It would be nice to do a play of language mm. where, um, cause I, I feel like what I was trained to do is to make language work, and I get to do a lot of that on television. I relish the scenes where I have a speech or a lecture, something about science or philosophy or something like that. I, I, I enjoy those kinds of scenes. But you get more of that in an old play, mm. you know, uh, an Elizabethan play or Moliere or, or Harold Pinter or wh what have you. Just plays where language is a bit more compressed or poetical and mo more uh, you have more text challenges. I, I, I enjoy that work. Well, whatever you do next, we're very excited uh, and interested, of course, to see what you do, Michael. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks. It's, it's been nice a real pleasure. You. Lovely to speak to you. Uh, and guys, thank you so much for watching and for all your fantastic questions. Uh, be sure to check out Person of Interest. It's on CBS. Remember, fifth and final series. You can find out more information about how to watch it on Huffington Post Entertainment. All the links are on that vertical page. And of course, you can find out more about Michael and his work as well. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Very, very pleasant to speak to you.